questions you have, you know, let me know if there's anything that uh, comes up that you have questions about with regard to the lecture and we can always uh, we can always shoot ideas. OK, so as I'm trying to pull up my screen here. Is this getting it? No, that's not it. Sonia's coming in to help me now. That's when I know no, I've. Uh, all right, here we go. A window, and then there it is. Perfect. Should be up soon. Hmm. Here. Now, and then here's the window, right? Odd. It says it's presenting. I'll present from my computer. Okay. All right, we're making a quick switch. Uh, Sonia's going to bring it here to my computer. Um, I know everyone's probably eating lunch right now, but if any pressing questions are there right now, I'm happy to answer as we're trying to work through our, uh, our, our my, my team's limitations. This is, I want to be clear, this is my, my challenge, so. Perfect. All right, hopefully everyone can see this. So this is a, uh, a guide for us and how we care for aging patients. And the nice thing is, is whether you see aging patients or not, hopefully we'll be able to take a lot of themes for this that you can take to any age range. We're gonna talk about things that affect basically all patients, whether they're children or older adults. But you may see a specific predilection for some of these things in older adults, and I want to just touch on them because these are questions I often get. So uh, Sonia and, and, and this Lunch and Learn series are so cool, and I think it's such a great way of getting community involved and, and sort of getting everyone together in, in, in uh, uh, thinking about you know specialty care and complex care and so I'm I'm just really appreciative to be invited to talk with you all and again very low key please let me know if there's anything that I can do to uh, to answer questions as we go so Sonia do you know if I have control of of advancing these I, I can advance them for you if that's okay great yeah can we go to the next slide. So I wanna to try to simplify this lecture to a few key points. So the learning objectives that we're gonna to have today are understanding the procedure of Mohs surgery. This is a question I get asked all the time. Number two is discussing the appropriate recommendations of emollients and topical steroids. This is helpful. This may be helpful for your, even your personal life when you're like, huh, which, uh, which moisturizer is the best moisturizer? And then we're also going to discuss the common causes of itch. This is the most common symptom that people over the age of 50 present to the dermatologist for, and it's something that we've all been miserable with at one point in our life. So I just want to talk about that, and again, something that you'll see in older adults, but across all age ranges. And then the last one, if we have time, is talking about red legs, and uh, you'll see why it's so important that we talk about red legs. Can we go to the next slide, Sonia? So this is just a pictorial representation of what we're going to do. So that's Mohs surgery. Those are emollients and those are some red legs. Next slide. I have no conflicts of interest related to this talk. Next slide. So while we went over learning objectives, it's important that you leave here with some pearls of knowledge. And I promised you from the name of this lecture that there were going to be some pearls. So these are the take home points. We're going to fly through them now, but hopefully at the end of the lecture, you'll be able to remember these. So the take home points are that Mohs surgery is not just normal surgery. It's different than what people perceive as traditional surgery. Number two is remembering the two rules of moisturizing. The third one is that topical steroids, the whole goal is to keep it simple and ignore the percentage on the bottle or the tub. Number four is that itching has many faces and the only question you really need to ask yourself in a primary care setting is if there is a rash or not. And then the last one is that when you see a red leg or red legs, don't always think cellulitis. Next slide. 
So Mohs, let's explain Mohs and just get this very clear so that everyone can understand exactly what Mohs is. So how is Mohs surgery different than traditional surgery and what does the day look like? That's the question I often get from patients and primary care as well as other specialties. Next slide. So what Mohs does is it goes in and the unique feature that it has is while it's excising a cancer, what it's able to do is in real time, while the patient is numbed, they're able to go into the, the lab in real time while the patient is waiting, and they can confirm if all the cancerous tissue is removed or not. So that's why it's such a unique procedure. So in image one there, you see they take the cancer out, but if you see at the base, there's still some black area at the base. So in image two, they look, they can see that there's still cancer present at the margin there, and in number three, they go back in and they only take, as you'll notice, they'll only take the, uh, the base of the lesion there. So they're not taking other tissue around it. So the beautiful thing about Mohs is that they're able to tissue save. They're not just going in and taking indiscriminate margins each time, which is great. And the other thing is they're able to get real-time confirmation if the cancer is completely removed. And that's why it has such wonderful cure rates. Next slide. So the day of is really important as well because it's not like going into the OR and having a surgery. It's an outpatient surgery. It's all under local anesthesia. But the challenge when you're advising a patient about it is about what the duration and the repair will look like because, of course, that's going to be property of the tumor. It's going to be depending on how deep it is, how many cuts you have to do, how many finger projections it has in all those directions. So a little bit the Mohs surgeon has to follow just what the cancer gives you. So there's a little bit of question when someone goes into the procedure itself. And that's important for us to lean into that, to be honest with the patient, that we're, we may not know how long it's going to take. And then, of course, at the end, the defect or the hole is going to be essentially the size of the tumor itself. So the repair will depend on what that looks like. And we won't know that until we actually go in. So the day of is actually pretty easy for the patient, but there are some question marks going into the day that we have to be clear about. Next slide, Sonia. So when we ask who is a great candidate for Mohs surgery, I like to, again, simplify this for everyone, including me and my residents. And if you could just press forward here, it's going to highlight two things. One is high, high risk anatomic location. So I want anyone who's worried about a skin cancer to be specifically concerned when it's in these high risk locations. We call it the T zone or the H zone of the face. And it's basically anything around mucous membrane. So eyelids, nose, ears, lips, genitalia, and fingers. Fingers would be the only outlier there. But those are typically more aggressive tumors. And so you want to be really, really cautious if you're worried about those patients to make sure to send them to the dermatologist, or if you're counseling patients about what best treatment they can pursue for their, their skin cancer, those are the places that you want to uh, you want to really highlight the best cure rates. And then the other one is tumors in immunosuppressed patients. We just know that with our wonderful uh, ability to uh, uh, immunosuppress patients and, and handle patients who've had uh, um, who've had uh, transplants, we're having this subpopulation who are now living much longer and they're starting to get more dangerous skin cancers after they've been on immunosuppression for a really long time. And dermatologists are starting to see, as, as everyone is in medicine, how dangerous these skin cancers can be. So don't sit on those patients. Make sure that they're seeing the right provider and that you're recommending the best treatment option for those patients, particularly if it's in a high-risk area. So those are the two that I want to leave you with when you're thinking about who who to or who not to send to Mohs surgery. Next slide. All right, let's move into the moisturizing realm. So I love this. When you put in best moisturizer into Google, you literally, literally get 250 million responses. And it probably feels like that when you're, uh, you know, in, on the, in the aisle at Walgreens or something like that. Um, and it can be really confusing as far as uh, how to choose uh, your moisturizer. And this is something that often comes up with patients. And it may seem trivial, but this is something that almost all patients do is choose a moisturizer. So, uh, you know, sometimes I've, I've given this lecture, people are like, well, who cares if we're talking about, you know, cardiac disease or we're talking about other things. And I agree with that, but this is something that you're going to get asked in your office. So it's great to have uh, a response to it. Go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> 
So I want you to look at this hierarchy of moisturizers. So solutions are the least moisturizing vehicle for anything, then gels, then foams, then lotions. And there's a firm line there between lotions and creams. And anything above lotion is actually hydrating to the skin. Uh, if you press the next uh, button, you'll see that there's a big red line there. And that red line really delineates where you're going to get moisturization from the skin. And why that's so important is that most people use lotions on the skin. So most lotions come in a, an, in a bottle that you can pump out. And the, the, what is required, the viscosity that's required to pump something out of a, uh, out of a, of a pump actually requires a certain amount of alcohol. And that alcohol feels great when it gets on your skin because it dries quickly, but it actually doesn't hydrate your skin. In fact, it can dehydrate your skin. So most people are using moisturizers that don't moisturize their skin. So in order to ensure that you and your patients and your family are actually hydrating their skin, my suggestion is always to ensure the cream or the ointment. And the way you do that is with my two rules. So on your next slide. Sorry, next slide, yeah, perfect. Moisturizing pearls, so the two rules. So one is that if it smells good, it's no good. So I wanna make sure that you're not using any scented or fragrant moisturizers. Those are known irritants to the skin. They're the most common allergen to the skin, particularly in older adults, so make sure that that's the case. And then number two, to make sure that you have a cream or an ointment, it must come in a tub. Must come in a tub, I'm gonna highlight that. It can't be pumped out, so it cannot pump it out. So you wanna make sure that it's scooped out and that it doesn't smell good. So those are the two rules I want you to leave here with. Doesn't matter what the product is, I just threw a couple that you may recognize. These are some of the ones that I like, but honestly, it does not matter. Just go down that Walgreens aisle, give that tub a smell, and as long as it doesn't have a smell, you should be good to go. Next slide. And very akin to uh, choosing a moisturizer is choosing a topical steroid. So this is probably something just more medically relevant that you often are doing for someone who has a rash or has something popping up. And that could be a daunting challenge because depending on where you trained or who you trained with, there's different names, different formulations that people often use. So I want to really simplify this. Um, next slide. So there's a as you as you saw from my photo there you know most patients come in and they have a, a load of these and 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 we are absolutely guilty of this in dermatology of of contributing to polypharmacy even if it is an internal polypharmacy there's still a lot of confusion of the topicals that we give so there and and that beca that's because there's a lot of topical steroids and, and you know we can use the the variety in in beneficial ways but often it comes at the expense of uh, at the expense of confusion for the patient. So there's, there's mild, moderate, uh, uh, very potent and, you know, sort of a middle ground area there. But I think you can think of, think about them as in this, in this sort of stepwise fashion. And the reason I highlight this is there's really only two types of topical steroids that come in a tub. So if someone is really itchy and you need to get hydration all over their body, there's really two that come in that tub. Next slide. Those two are hydrocortisone and triamcinolone. So this is part of my take-home point for you is I want you to, one, oh, simplify your approach to topical steroids. I think that every primary care, and my wife is a primary care, so I, I so appreciate what everyone does in primary care. Um, I think every primary care uh, provider should have two go-tos, and these are my suggestion for your go-tos. So one is hydrocortisone. The reason why that's great is one, it comes in a tub, as I mentioned, so you can get it in high volume. And then number two is because it's cheaper. Um, so you can feel free to, 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 to know that you're not gonna be upcharging a patient or, or you're not gonna be costing them a ton of money for a topical steroid. Hydrocortisone is the lower potency topical steroid of choice. It's much stronger than the hydrocortisone that's over the counter. And we often use it for sensitive areas like the face or the genitals uh, or the armpits if need be. But think about it as your weaker topical steroid. And then the next one that should be a go-to is your mid-potent topical steroid, which is your triamcinolone.
So triamcinolone also comes in a tub, which is a great benefit. So you get a lot of volume for it. And it comes in both creams and ointments, as does hydrocortisone. So you can use that to your advantage in hydrating as well. This one's a little too strong for some of those sensitive areas, which is why it pairs well with hydrocortisone. So we don't want this one used on the face, the armpit, or the groin, at least not for long extended periods of time. But these are the two that I recommend. And if you'll notice, my other take-home point is don't look at the percentages. And why is that? So hydrocortisone is weaker than triamcinolone. But if you look at the percentages, you'll see that hydrocortisone is 2.5% and triamcinolone is 0.1%. And so that's often very confusing for the patients. And what happens is they ultimately start using the wrong one in the wrong areas. And so you wanna just nip that in the bud right from the start and explain to them that, look, this is gonna be the one that's for more sensitive areas. I don't want you to be looking at the percentage of this. This one is the one that we're gonna use all over the body. Sometimes you can even use the size of the cream that you prescribe to your advantage. So for example, if someone's using hydrocortisone for the face and triamcinolone for the body, you may wanna use a small amount for the face, something like a 30 gram tube, and then you wanna use the tub, which is 454 grams for the uh, body. Those are just some nuanced ways of starting to prescribe these, but long story short, the take home points are simplify your approach, all you need is really two go-to topical steroids, a weaker one and a mid-potency topical steroid, and then prophylax with the patient. Make sure they know that it can be confusing to look at the percentages, so completely ignore them. Next slide, please. So now we'll get into something that's my research interest, which is the physiology of aging skin. And while we'll jump over this, I, I feel badly jumping over it because each one of these bullet points is its own career. Why this is so important is because it directs uh, it 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 directly connects to what we see in the clinic, and that connection comes in this form. Next slide, please. No, it's not Game of Thrones. It's itching. So if you're a Game of Thrones fan, this is the the many face gods. But uh, you know, I like this for the many faces of itch. So itch is uh, is, is is such a fascinating and challenging clinical um, presentation, and it's a miserable, miserable experience for patients. But when we look at it, it's just a symptom, and that's why it carries so many faces. It's often hiding behind this sort of ubiquitous uh, common symptom, but really there's a lot of pathophysiology that goes behind it. And my personal opinion on this is it's reflective of a lot of different processes that are going on in the aging body, and, um, and we can learn a lot about aging from our study of itch. So I'll try to explain a, a, a nuanced approach of itching and feel free to interrupt me as we get into this, but this is definitely something you're gonna see in your clinics. So next slide, please. So when we think about itching, it's not an allergy. That's a very common misconception. And that's often a misconception seen in the lay public that when someone's itching, they just have an allergy. And really, I want to reframe the schematic of itching for you. And it's really the interface between three main cell types. Those are nerves, immune cells, and keratinocytes. Now, that's an oversimplification. Of course, within each of those veins, there's a lot of different types of cells. But I want to start thinking about, I want to start teaching about itch in those three pockets, because that's really where we're seeing itch predominate. And instead of being isolated, for example, someone with immune itch or nerve itch, we can often think of them with overlapping hoops. So Sonia, would you uh, go to the next slide? We often see these types of um, these types of itches sort of overlap with each other. And that's why it can get so confusing. And that's why it seems like it has many faces. But when you're approaching it and someone comes in and they're very itchy, there's a really defined uh, way that you can start to approach these patients. And that's by asking one simple question. Is there any rash or no? And the reason for that is you'll start to understand which of those contributing cells is really the dominant factor there when you see a rash or when you don't see a rash. So for example, when you see a rash, we're gonna start thinking down the immune side of the equation. So those are things like eczema, or hives, or xerotic changes like dry skin, or folliculitis, or atopic dermatitis, or bullous pempagoid, or even scabies, which is an overactivation of the immune system caused by the scabetic mice. But if there's no rash, then we start to think about nerves, 
or primary keratinocyte activation that are the main drivers. Things like lymphomas, things like kidney disease, liver disease, thyroid disease, or other inciting features here. And the most common one that we often see is neuropathic itch, which is a completely black hole as far as our treatment for neuropathic itch. But you can start to think about it as a contributing or a driving etiology if you look at a patient who's itching and they don't have a rash. Next slide. So I wanna take you through a couple pictures here so that we can do some drilling on this. So first one here, I'm gonna give you two seconds to decide on this, rash, no rash. So you see some erythema of the mid arms, you see some erythema of the flanks, you see that really thick overlying flaky scale on the extensor arms. Next slide. This is a, a picture of those hands. Sometimes we say this is a flaking scale that just falls off all over you if you're doing the exam. And this person should, probably should be wearing gloves here because this is actually a case of Norwegian scabies. We go to the next case. So this is a case where you're going to see a rash and that's very clearly something that's driving the immune system. And that can start to drive your differential. Next slide. Here's another one. So rash, no rash. Here's one where we're thinking rash. And the reason I'm saying this is where people get stuck in this is they look at this and this is nonspecific. And this is a really itchy patient. And because they can't give a specific name to this, which I would challenge almost nobody can, even dermatologists, then they struggle to be able to treat the patient. So I want you to just simplify this, rash, no rash. This is clearly a rash, next slide. This is actually a newer entity called the immunologic eruption of aging, which is actually almost akin to like atopic dermatitis of older adults. It's uh, a reflection of the um, aging immune system, which has this TH2 or atopic predomination. And so this is another reason why we often see itching in older adults. These patients actually don't meet the formal criteria for atopic dermatitis because it's often acute in onset, but we see this very frequently in older adults. So long story short, I do not want you to be diagnosing this specific entity in your clinics, but this is again to drill the point of rash or no rash and then start to think, okay, this if there's a rash, this is probably an immunologically driven itch. Next slide. Here's another one that's very common in older adults. These are red papules typically seen on the chest of older adults. Next slide. Next slide. So this is Grover's disease. If you haven't seen it, you'll probably see it later today. It's super, super, super common. It's not always itchy, but very common on the chest and back of older adults. Also likely reflective of an aging immune system and changes in the immune system and how they respond to um, uh, surface changes on the skin. We're not 100% sure, but something to just keep in mind. But again, clearly with the drill, rash, no rash. This is clearly one with a rash. We want to start thinking down the immunologic side. Next slide. This is another picture of uh, up close scape. Uh, I'm sorry, up close Grover's disease. We can go to the next slide. Next. Perfect. So this is how I want you to start thinking about itching is you now have your hoops, your neuropathic hoop, your immunologic hoop and your keratinocytic hoop. And the way you start to pair through this is by asking that primary question. But it's also OK to lean into the fact that it may not always be just singular one thing. So next slide. Here's another case of, a, of a, a very common itchy rash in older adults. I'm showing it in abnormal places where you may not traditionally see it. Next slide, this is around the ears. You're seeing a thin scale. And then on the face, the same rash uh, along the glabella and the nasolabial folds, you also see this thin erythematous, these thin erythematous plaques with overlying scale. Next slide. This is another one you can see on the central chest. Why this would be different than Grover's disease is it's, it's gonna have a scale on it as opposed to just a papular or just a bumpy dermatitis. Next slide. So this is seborrheic dermatitis. So this is something, again, you're gonna see twice a day in, an, in a practice with older adults. It has some associations, but it's very, very common across all populations from children to older adults. So just keep this one in mind and think of those abnormal areas like on the chest or in the ears or behind the ears. Next slide. <laughs> 
Here's a trick one. So this is, is this rash or no rash? Because we have limited time, I'm going to go right into it. So this is actually no rash. So those are just scratch marks or excoriations. What we call this is there's no primary skin changes. These are only secondary skin changes. So now we've asked that question, rash or no rash. This one's no rash. And so that means we're going down the neuropathic route or the internal route that is triggering neuropathic itch, like with kidney disease or something like liver disease. So that's our differential building there. So here on the right forearm, this is actually a really famous and well-described type of neuropathic itch. And it's described by the location. It's called brachioradial paritis. It's thought to be related to nerve impingements in the cervical spine. And the reason why we know it's that is that this is a no rash itch that's fixed. So that's another pearl here is if you're finding uh, itching and it's not moving on the body, and of course there's no rash with it, that may be something that you wanna consider neuropathic in nature. Next uh, slide, please. Here's another patient, rash or no rash. This is a tough one, the picture isn't great, but you can see a little bit of that, that uh, darkening of the skin in the mid back there. That's actually also a secondary skin change. So this is not a primary rash, this is actually another neuropathic condition called notalgia paresthetica also thought to be by thought to be a um, thought to be an impingement of the cervical spine that and the impingement there's theories but it either happens coming out of the of the joint spaces or or the facet spaces or it's actually in the musculature uh, going out to the skin so anyway there's a lot of theories as to why people get it here but again this is a no rash fixed itch that points to a neuropathic etiology next slide And we basically went over all that good stuff. Next slide. Sorry that those pictures got uh, jumbled up. Here's a really common one that I just wanted to bring up in, in this lecture because we're talking about older adults. So this is the lecture that in everyone's medical training we've we've seen before. Uh, this is sort of the, I, I call it the sexy picture because it's the one that's got sort of the awe factor. So this is bullous pemphigoid. Of course, in the rash, no rash, this is certainly a rash. Um, and this is a really pyritic itchy condition. Now, why I want to show you this is because while this is the sexy picture that everyone has seen in their training, this is actually the least common presentation of bullous pemphigoid. The most common presentation of bullous pemphigoid is much more subtle than this and is actually described as something called pre-bullous bullous pemphigoid or non-bullous bullous pemphigoid or urticarial phase bullous pemphigoid. So if you go to the next slide, we'll start to see sort of the more mild versions of this. So here you can see that there's a little bit of blistering there, but the predominant sort of feature that you're seeing here are these juicy uh, orange, pink, red plaques that really don't have blistering in them, and they're almost purple. And then if you go to the next one, you'll see even uh, less descript uh, bullous formation, and this is actually bullous pemphigoid. So I wanna familiarize you all with that as well. And that's why it's so helpful to not think about seeing uh, when you're looking at the, the 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 itch differential or thinking about an itch differential, it's not about walking in the room and having the perfect answer because it's not always very obvious. Um, what's more important is creating that schematic of how do you work through it. So the first thing to ask is rash, no rash. Here's a rash. Even if it doesn't look like bullous pemphigoid right off the bat, you're still in that immunologic category and thus your treatments should be partially therapeutic before you end up uh, um, uh, uh, treating the patient or sending them out. All right, next slide. Excellent. So we'll go back to rash, no rash. This is the this is the great question. As you know, we've already drilled you on that. So just something to think about when you're when you're working up itch or thinking about itch. Think about rash or no rash. Next slide. Sonia, I can't see the clock. How are we doing on time? Not bad on time. It's about 1233. Oh, perfect. All right. So one other thing that I, you know, after I gave you the the, the rash, no rash take home point, there's one other one that I want to just make sure that uh, that you can you, you, you have some footing for you for the next time you see these patients. So in these circumstances, if you do have a rash, 
when you're asking yourself rash, no rash. From a treatment standpoint, I think the very appropriate primary care first step is just to make sure the patient is moisturized and that they have a topical steroid. Now you have to be cautious with all topical steroids. So for example, if you didn't think about scabies in a certain patient as the insider for the immune system, you wanna make sure that that's in the back of your head, but topical steroids do transiently help scabies. So there's of course an asterisk there, but I think that's a great starting point when you're thinking about that immunologic pathway for patients with a rash who are itchy. And then on the other side is if there is no rash and you're thinking about a neuropathic cause or an internal cause, here is a really good um, lab workup to consider to make sure to rule out all the, the, the really nefarious things. So a CBC with differential is going to help you rule out a lymphoma. A TSH is going to help you rule out or at least uh, uh, rule out or in uh, thyroid disease. A liver panel can be really helpful, including ALK-FOS, which is usually what you'll find with uh, biliary disease or active biliary disease that's causing um, pruritus kidney function, of course, and then HIV. Those would be a really good starting point. So that's really just a CBC, a CMP, a TSH, TSH, and an HIV test. So I think that's a really good starting point. And if all of those are negative, then you can really start focusing on a primary neuropathic itch course, which is often uh, treated like pain. So I hope this gives you a little bit of a foundation to jump off for those patients that can be really challenging. All right, next, uh, next slide. All right, the challenge of the red legs. Let's go to the next slide. So why is this such a challenge? So there's almost 15 million cases a year, almost over six, almost, yeah, basically all, over 500,000 uh, admissions a year. And as we're, as we're taught, it's the swelling, the color with redness and pain. Those are really the main ones that we often find with this. And uh, we've all seen this at some point in our career or at least answered questions about it at some point in our career. So it's one of those can't miss diagnoses. Next slide. But I want to add one more thing. We go back. That's, that's for my, my cheesy formal effect. The last one is that it's almost always unilateral. So that would that's probably the most important thing that we can do on a physical exam other than the things that we've been taught in, in our various schoolings. But one thing to add to there is the unilaterality of symptoms. I'll show you how that can be nuanced, but keep that in mind when you're thinking of the tumor, rubor, color, and dolor. Next slide. So here is a really simplistic model that I think is really helpful. And this was validated by a group at Mass General Hospital. And essentially what they found was that the most diagnostic feature of anyone presenting with red legs is, is asymmetry. And I mean diagnostic for cellulitis. So keep that in mind. This was basically a scoring system that they used. Don't worry about the scoring system, but essentially what the, the, the two most important factors for diagnosing cellulitis were unilaterality and age. So as, as the, my take home point from this is not necessarily age or anything like that, but really that unilaterality is such an important diagnostic feature here that I want to make sure everyone is highlighting because often what you're what uh, what we're seeing is red legs that look bilateral. And if you're not seeing a process that's happening just on one side, it's very rarely infected. It's very rare to get bilateral cellulitis. Next slide. So here's a little bit of a, of a, of a treatment suggestion. I'm, I'm gonna run over this because everything, uh, everything here is basically based on what's available in your clinic. But for uncomplicated uh, um, uh, cellulitis, you can always treat with uh, cephalexin. That's my starting one. But if there's any suspected exposure to MRSA, you can start with Doxy or Minnow or Bactrim. Um, and then of course, if uh, they only have one SERS criteria and not two, then you can consider still doing oral, but you want to make sure that uh, you're keeping a very close eye on them. And of course, if they're showing any signs of systemic involvement, you want to transition to IV. Those are just a couple quick pearls, but let's go to the next slide. I think it'll be a little bit more helpful and practical. Next slide. So the one that I often see is if, if there's any group home exposure that you may want to also cover for MRSA. And then the last one is if your clinic has the capability of doing a culture, it can save your life 
and save the patient's life down the down the road a couple of days because you'll have some empiric data that if they're not responding to antibiotics, you have. So keep that in mind. Again, I know that's an, that's a that's a product of availability at clinic and comfort, but keep that in mind if you feel comfortable doing a culture on a leg. Next slide. So here's the take home point for the red legs, and it's that all that is red, red is not infected. So I hope that we can expand your differential here for the red legs. And why is this such an important feature? So about 50 to 130,000 unnecessary admissions. So that's about one in five, one in six admissions for cellulitis uh, is actually not a cellulitis. And it costs almost half a billion dollars or estimated half a billion dollars to our medical system. The most common mimics of cellulitis are stasis dermatitis, stasis dermatitis, and more stasis dermatitis. But you can also consider contact dermatitis, psoriasis, and vasculitis on that differential. But I would stress stasis dermatitis is the most common mimic. And we're going to do, again, some drills on that so to help uh, as, as, as you're seeing these patients. Next slide. So here's a patient that actually has stasis dermatitis. All these next patients have stasis dermatitis. I'm gonna, yeah, spoiler alert. Um, and I wanna highlight this because there's a couple features here that are so important. So someone may look at this and think this is bilateral or this is unilateral. And yes, there are certainly unilateral changes, but what's unique about this patient is that there's two, there's, there's a bilateral process going on. It's just different on one leg than the other. So by visual diagnostics, I would never be able to tell that this is not cellulitis. But when you ask the patient if this is painful, if it's if it's painful or itchy, or if um, if it's hot to touch, if none of those things are there on a process where you can see that there's something going on on both legs, you can consider this just a different presentation of a bilateral process. So this is actually stasis dermatitis, just presenting differently on each leg. And that happens a lot because our vasculature and our draining system change a lot as we age on each leg. And that can depend on um, you know, no past medical history of vascular disease, or someone may have a really profound vascular history, and that can give you credence as to why you're thinking the bilateral process is presenting a little differently. Next slide. Here's another one. This is another common mistake that I see. So this is a, a common presentation of irritant dermatitis, which can be a presentation of, of, of stasis dermatitis. But why I wanna highlight this slide is that redness. So that redness is something that we really don't see a lot unless you rub your skin raw. And uh, why this is so important is sometimes we see this and because it's so red, we call it cellulitis. But the interesting thing here is that this skin is actually itchy. It's not tender. Um, it's, uh, it's not hot to touch. So all those factors can, can go into uh, your decision making here to say, hey, this is probably in need of moisture more so than antibiotics. So I want to familiarize your, you all with different colors so that you can not be shocked by those colors. Because I know when I see this, I'm like, oh my gosh, that needs some attention. And my first inclination is to be like, oh, that probably needs a big gun. But then as I go through my, my schematic of red legs, I realize that that's just the color of really, really profound irritation, but not infection. Next slide. Here's another great image of that uh, of that extent of redness. So this got called a cellulitis, and uh, this is just another example of stasis dermatitis with acute irritation. So we call this acute on chronic stasis dermatitis. Next slide. Here's another great example of a bilateral process that's presenting differently. So these are actually two different versions of stasis dermatitis. So on the left leg, the one that doesn't have the redness, this is actually a deeper version of stasis dermatitis called lipodermatosclerosis. We, we call this the inverted champagne bottle because of its shape. And essentially, this is just stasis dermatitis that's affecting the deeper layers of the skin and actually affecting the planes between the, flats, the fat cells, and it's causing this tightening or sclerosis. So that lipodermatosclerosis is a very known effect of stasis dermatitis, but it's still a form of stasis dermatitis. Whereas on the other side of the leg, that's a more traditional view of stasis dermatitis. Now you can still see that there's some deeper sclerotic changes of the leg because the anatomy of the leg is a little bit disrupted, but it carries more of that superficial change, that redness, that scaling. So this is actually a bilateral process bilaterally, 
uh, that's going on, that's active bilaterally. And um, because this patient wasn't in pain, you can say, okay, this is a bilateral process and this is likely stasis dermatitis and you don't have to admit this patient or send them somewhere. Okay, next slide. And then again, just more drilling of pictures of stasis dermatitis. Again, just different colorations. So this is in a patient who has darker skin complexion. We like everyone to see different presentations in different skin colors so that you can see how redness presents. So this is actually erythema or redness that's uh, on someone who has darker complexion. And you see it's a little bit more blunted. The redness doesn't pop as much. And that can be confusing for people. So again, this is something that you would want to make sure is going on bilaterally. You would want to make sure is not itchy. Uh, and if it wasn't itchy and it was tender, then that would be a cellulitis diagnosis if it was unilateral. Next slide. This is a really chronic uh, presentation of stasis dermatitis. And it's basically that some people, instead of sclerosing down, they actually have a hyperkeratotic response. So they have a proliferative response to stasis dermatitis. And this is, again, something that we see in the setting of chronic stasis dermatitis, where the skin is growing. It's called elephantiasis veruca nostra. And it's often mistaken as some sort of fungal infection or it's, an, uh, 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 or, or it's mistaken for something other than stasis dermatitis. So it's another response. And again, I'm just showing you, drilling you on the variety of different presentations that chronic stasis dermatitis can show. And again, this is something that you would want to make sure is going on bilaterally in order to make a really definitive call that this is not infectious in nature. All right, next, next uh, slide. So as we're comparing these, cellulitis is almost always unilateral. That's probably more important than pain itself. It's almost always somewhat painful. You'll often find a point of entry. It may be toe fungus infection. It may be a cut on the foot, but you're gun, you're, you should find a point of entry for the infection. And then of course, you're gonna see, find someone with, uh, uh, in severe cases with systemic symptoms, SERS criteria, fever and chills. And then the comparison to that is stasis dermatitis, which is the most common mimic and what people are often admitted to the hospital for incorrectly. This is almost always bilateral, and we know that that bilateral process does not have to look the same on each leg. It's almost always itchy and not painful. You'll often see in the superficial forms some sort of scale or hyperkeratosis or thickening of the skin. And then, of course, these patients are not going to have systemic symptoms. And my theory is that we're actually missing a lot more of these patients because what happens is that these patients get admitted, they're, they get put in a hospital bed and their legs get put up. And what happens is then the blood drains from their static legs and their legs get better. And so the thought is, oh, we gave them vancomycin and we put them in the hospital and they got better. And really all, all they needed was uh, uh, some, some flow help on the legs. So I think this is probably an undercalled problem. And I think we all see these patients and can all be primed on, uh, on how to work through this challenging red leg diagnosis. Next slide. I think it's only fair to, as I, as I'm closing up this lecture to do one more thing, which is to show you, this is an article on one of our famous derm journals where they show the different types of red legs. So here's the DVT, calciphylaxis, stasis dermatitis, next slide, hematoma, erythema migrans, and cellulitis. The reason I put this up here is I don't think people who give presentations do this enough, but I just want to acknowledge, and, and Sonia, if you can go back one slide and sort of toggle through these it is really hard to figure this out. So I just want to give everyone sort of the space and the comfort to be like, it's not always easy to walk in a room and be like, oh, that's cellulitis or, oh, that's stasis dermatitis. And I think this article, I, I remember reading it and kind of laughing at it because I was like, you know, not, th these all look very similar. So anyway, I just want to give everybody the, 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 whatever it is, the space to, to, to feel comfortable in saying that, hey, this is really hard. It's still hard for us in dermatology where we pride ourselves on our visual diagnostics. So anyway, they can all look very similar and just keep those in mind as it's not always cellulitis if it's red. So keep that differential broad. All right, next slide. And here we are at the end of our lecture, we're gonna talk about the take home points. So we now know that Mohs surgery is different than surgery. 
You'll help someone counsel them through making the right decision. And you'll also help them with who is the highest risk patients. And those are people with high risk lesions in the T or H zone on the face around mucous membranes. And then of course, of, cor of course, those who are chronically immune suppressed. The two rules of moisturizing, one, if it smells good, it's no good. And number two, it has to be scooped out of a tub. It can't be pumped out. That's to prioritize hydrating creams and ointments over the less hyd hydrating lotions that are ubiquitous in every household in the United States. Number three, with your topical steroids, keep it simple. Have two go-tos that you can use as much as you want, hydrocortisone and triamcinolone, and then have the patients ignore the percentage. Don't try to... Uh, um, uh, don't try to prescribe too many different ones to patients because we do that in dermatology and, and we're all at risk of, 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 of exposing the patient to polypharmacy. They get confused and they're using the wrong one in the wrong place. Number four is that itch has many faces. You now know that there's three main contributors, the immune system, the nervous system, and the primary skin system, the keratinocyte, that are the three main players. And the way that you help work through which one is the dominant contributor is asking if someone has a rash or not. If they do have a rash, you can start down the immunologic treatment pathway, which is moisturizing and topical steroids, of course, with the caveat of paying attention to if there's a concern for scabies or other infections that can cite the immune system. And then if there is no rash, you want to consider a systemic workup to make sure there's no internal cause of itching like liver disease or kidney disease or lymphoma. And then if those aren't there, you can consider uh, neuropathic causes and neuropathic treatments. And then the last one is the diagnosis of red legs is really hard. It's not always cellulitis. And think about stasis dermatitis and look at the bilateral processes, even if the legs aren't the exact same in appearance. So that's all I have today. Thank you so much. I'm happy to answer any questions about these topics or other topics that you all hear. I, I think you know the work that's done in primary care settings is so, so, so important for our patients and for our communities. And anything I can do to help, um, I would love to hear. And, and, any, and any feedback you all have for us in the dermatology community, I, I can always uh, uh, I, I can always briefly speak for our dermatology community um, on things that we can do better. So thank you all so much. And thank you, Sonia, for putting this together and for Banner for having this and bringing us all uh, in this Lunch and Learn uh, series. Thank you, Dr. Butler. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to speak up or type them in the chat and we will respond to them. We got one. We got one. We got one that said, "Cerave smells good." All right, fair enough. That's a good. That's a good nuanced point. I would say if it if it's fragrant, if it's fragrant, then you shouldn't use it. But remember, I mean, here's the hard part: is that all these the, all these companies use um, all these companies have different you know variations of their creams and ointments. Like Vaseline is like the holy grail for us in dermatology. And the other day, my 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 dad brought home Vaseline that was like honey scented. So like they all have, you know, sort of products that I wouldn't recommend within their their repertoire within their their armamentarium. So you know that's why it's 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 extra confusing because if I say hey you know you go ahead and use Cerave, I'm sure they have a fragrant and scented product. But what you want to make sure to focus on is Cerave that's unscented. Um, that's where you're really going to find the best. Um, the best hydration effects, and you're going to avoid any type of uh, allergenic response, which we know is really common with fragrances. <laughs> 
There's a question asking um, if the slides will be emailed for future reference. Are you OK with me sending out the slide presentation to those who have joined? Of course, no problem. Perfect. We will send it out. Can you touch on topical steroid use and skin biopsies? Yeah, of course. Um, Delaney's a, 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 a well-known face for us, you know, so topical steroids, as I mentioned before, are, uh, you know, the, the there can be really confusing because everyone has different exposure to them. I think the way to think about them is first to know their side effects. So the, the, the effects of topical steroids are that they can thin your skin, um, that they can cause purpura, which is an effective thinning of the skin. Those are the side effects. But really, the, the the thing to know about the side effects is that they take a long time for people to actually develop. And while I don't want to take you know all the the protective wheels we have off about them, the main issue I see with topical steroids and causing issues long term in the skin is just when someone's using it with sort of no oversight and no 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 vigilance. So I, I would encourage everyone that if you're prescribing any topical steroid, even, even weak ones, even telling someone to use hydrocortisone, say on the face or something like that, that you don't want to be just sending in the prescription because it's not necessarily one prescription that's going to do the problem or be the problem. It's going to be three years down the line when, you know, then when someone's been getting a, a, a filled prescription and now, you know, they come in and they're treating something and they, you know, they've, they've thinned their skin out so much or they have steroids induced acne and we're trying to sort of backpedal hard on that and then delaney I'm, I'm curious any specific questions about skin biopsies like when to do them when not to do them what do you think no um nothing in particular my um only recommendation would just be sometimes when um we do get patients who have been using steroid creams on a rash and it's time to biopsy it oftentimes that steroid use can actually skew our results that was kind of the main point that i was getting at but Honestly, Dr. Butler, this was a great presentation. You did a great job highlighting all of the clinical pearls. So thank you for doing this. Awesome. Yeah, that's such a great, that's such a great point. You know, um, when someone's coming in for diagnostic yield, you want to make sure that yield is there. I would tell, you know, I, t I was having this conversation with a patient yesterday, like what's the perfect amount of time? There probably isn't a perfect amount of time. I don't want to leave you all in primary care setting saying to the patient, like, don't use anything until you see the dermatologist because that may be a long time, hopefully not, but that may be a long time. Um, so I would tell patients that they should at least have about a two or three day window between the last application of topical steroids of a rash and when they're seeing their dermatologist. Obviously, if they're miserable without one day of topical steroids or any really any type of treatment, then they can treat through it, but just make sure they're telling the dermatologist that. Thank you. Are there any other questions, comments, discussion? Alrighty. Well, thank you again, Dr. Butler, and thank you everybody for joining in and um, giving your time up during the lunch hour. We will have this again next month and we appreciate it. Have a great week. Take care, everybody. Thank you.